Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome to another episode of Fireside Chats. Excited to be here with you. And I have a very special member of our group. Well, he's not actively in as a member of our group, but he's one of our, uh, well, for me anyway, someone that I can learn so much and I feel so inspired every time I speak to him. I couldn't wait to have him on our Fireside Chat because he's very kind of private, but also full of wisdom so you know what these fireside chats are about you guys this is when we learn from your story learn from your wisdom and we practice authenticity and be practice authenticity embrace vulnerability and to be with truth so for that reason um these fire chat side side chats exist and i can't speak today <laughs> I think I think it's been a while I haven't done a fireside chat when so welcome thank you so much for accepting to be here thank you so much Susan I appreciate it very much being here amazing um, as I said earlier um, you're not very active on Facebook uh, you're and the reason I really wanted to have this conversation with you Swan because I admire people when they have, they practice self-agency and they seem to kind of follow what's good for them, like knowing the difference, what's good for them, what serves them rather than what the majority is doing. Um, I know you use Facebook for, you know, some reasons and um, I know that you're not always active, but also um, having you here was quite difficult for me because it is the most difficult when you are trying to um, connect with someone who is so, uh, someone who's, uh, who's a free thinker and who is detached and who's not part of the, you know, the conditioning and the, the, the social norms. Um, I'm always fascinated to connect with those people. And I see you as one of those people and would love to hear about your story a little bit you you have a, you're an actor and um you must have some amazing life experiences so i don't know where to start because there's so much we can choose to go through like you know take the angle but what would you like to say about self-agency like how did you get to a place where you're no longer you know controlled or at least um um, conditioned or like your actions or your decisions are not based on the the social norms or the status quo or the things that we're conditioned with if you know what I mean does that make sense um, it does make sense I I think you're quite a generous human being Susan and maybe you are I I'm I'm definitely aspiring and I do think that the the ability to self self reference is something that is going to be it's a transferable skill that i would if i was to you know and i don't advise but if i was if somebody asked me i would say cultivate that ability to like i mean so like my journey is the same as everybody like we are not limited to these physical bodies in the sense that we are and this is not some this is like scientific like hardcore like sometimes it's like in this day and age you have to back something that used to be common sense if you can back it with a scientific fact and people might believe in it like you know but like we are made of stardust i mean the atom in our bodies is literally not metaphorically but literally same as stars you know stars that died and you know like the nitrate the carbon in our bodies is is stardust so with that kind of you know we also have abilities that you know any super com computer would never ever like you know maybe with quantum computing and stuff but we are i suppose we are much more powerful than we are taught and and that that's that whole thing about 
the fear, the deepest fears, not, not that we're inadequate, our deepest fears that we're powerful. And and to truly shine our light as well has a whole kind of, you know, we are light beings. We, we are literally made of light. You know, so all this kind of a feel, so we come into this world with this innocence and this, you know, leadership. You know, we're all children. Look at all children. They're all leaders. They know exactly what they want. They know that they can express their needs. And there is that kind of like, so I think like my journey is actually to become childlike and become innocent and become like simple, you know, and and kind of like so a lot of it has been educating myself out of all this you know you know it's like ram Dass would use these kind of to say like shrink into this ill-fitting suit of or i mean so you know so i found the old normal difficult i have no interest in the new normal let's just say it like that i i'm not going to try to conform to the new normal but like uh so, yeah, did that make well, any well, sense? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got a couple of things I want to take this, uh, open a window here. But first, what would you define the new normal as? Like, what is the new normal from your perspective? You said you don't want to fit in. You're not interested in the new normal. Um, well... Well, I am and I aren't. I mean, there's like, it's like, that's, I think here, like, then we have to employ this ability to transcend, you know, and, and uh, there is this kind of like the consensus reality. And like, so, but I, so then like here, like I am just, I'm just a little man, you know, I'm still, plugged into the matrix i'm not free from <laughs> you know i'm not like i'm not like an awakened and uh, you know truly sovereign in my in everything i do but i i do think that there is that like i've been inspired by for instance the people who made the film thrive what on earth will it take and they made another one thrive the second one and they say when we like if we're like healing and we work within this realm of we would like to manifest and create our reality etc and and we're we're in this breaking points that i think a lot of those people who might have been buying into this idea of we're creating our own reality and we are creating our own reality but we're certainly more we're co-creating reality and we're co-creating with a lot of different people and a lot of powerful people in the field but there is that element of we may not always get what we kind of put out but we do get susan we do get what we're willing to tolerate you know and there has to be a break and point i i would say there would have to be a critical mass of what i would call sense I'm not necessarily talking about common sense here, but I'm talking about sense, where it's like collectively, I mean, how much are we willing to collectively tolerate? Like, you know, I wouldn't give up my freedom for safety. I think freedom is a is a is a is a is a is a inalienable right. You know, I want to like, but you know, I'm also like there's a lot of powerful people in the field and there's this this power you know being used i i just get frustrated when i look at this complete waste of resources you know <laughs> you could feed the entire world <laughs> yeah i mean you could feed the entire world you could no ch child needed to go without food and and you know you could like there's enough i mean this is like so i i think there's a breaking point and that's where maybe you know when you've kind of had enough when you've had enough of seeing like a waste because i 
like whichever way we choose to go with this like if you like i i watched the site guys film for instance back in the day i you know they talk about the root word of the word economy is economize and that means minimizing waste and unfortunately what we've seen is is economies that are actually maximizing waste because the only way you can create uh, you take something from nature that is free, that nature gives freely. Then you commodify it, and you, and then you you sell it with this, and then a lot of that commodified things end up in landfill. And but what I'm frustrated about is like when I think about human abilities and human creativity and human ingenuity, it's like so many times people are trained to become that little kind of clock in the wheel but they're not actually awakening to who they really are and why like why am i here why am i here at this time in human history why are you here and i do suggest we all have to initiate our own personal paradigm shift and we have to face our fears you know f fear is real in the sense that it's you know they say false of evidence appearing real i mean that's easy to say <laughs> it's easy to say but unless you face the fear how can you ever hope to live in love and i do think that we have to you know i do want to live in love i do want to live in a in a state of grace and and coherence and so therefore i seek out people who are resonant with that kind of information and therefore i you know, I choose a path of non-aggression. You know, I, 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 I truly believe that there is enough for everybody. But that comes from like when you've had enough. Yeah. When you can yeah. had enough of the the manipulation, this distortion, this, you know, and you kind of like when you think like I am enough, you know, and I want to act from this place of nurturing my yeah yeah learning to put oneself first is something that's quite an important leadership quality as well you know and so so and learning to really feel into like so for instance it's not like i'm not speaking from anything i'm saying i have wavered the right to be right for a very long time i don't even believe in my own thoughts susan i mean i have a lot of thoughts coming in and sometimes i check as a do I really even believe in that? You know, I don't. Mm. <laughs> I think, like uh, most of what I, when I, I have been invited to to speak by various people in in, and most of the times I would speak like if I was to give advice to my, and again I don't give it, but like I am talking about acquiring transferable skills, for instance, gaining skills, gaining experience, learning to spot opportunities, that the kind of entrepreneurial way of of outlook that's kind of what i'm talking about in some when i when people ask me about things you know and uh again the self-referencing but like krishnamurti the philosopher i was introduced i have a very good friend um who introduced me to marshall rosenberg's nonviolent communication and he talks about uh the philosopher krishnamurti who said that uh, what was it? Observing without evaluation. The ability to observe without evaluating is the highest form of intelligence. And there's this kind of when we're in this construct of this is right, this is wrong, you know, we're in this kind of like, you know, we're, we're on the roller coaster, isn't it? You know, I mean, yeah, we are like the whatever happens to this planet Earth, you know, spinning around its own axis, flowing around a big ball of fire with other planets spiraling. you know it's kind of like I, I sometimes i say relax because everything is out of control you know we're, we're on the roller coaster we're not getting off so let's enjoy the ride but what i what what i would like to put out is that i think it's possible to I think it's possible to reach kind of a critical mass of sense where 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 
like so many people just go like you know what i've, I've absolutely had enough of this <laughs> i completely and utterly had enough of this and you know i mean so like i don't know i i, I, I love it I love I love everything you said so far. I'm just so quiet because everything is so resonating with me right now. And one of the things that I've taken away from you, I still kind of anchored it because I do have this habit that when I connect with people that I resonate with, there's always something that they say that deeply anchors me. And um, I use it again in like then I take that and I use that in um, situations and uh, challenges in the because you know life is a whole series of drama and challenge right life is pain life is uncertain and life is it is how it is and uh, we live in the uncertainty and um doesn't matter how much we know or how much we appreciate the spiritual context the transcendental approach um as soon as we hit with a obstacle or a challenge or something painful, it's almost like it's all gone out the window. And then we are on the, we go straight down into the baseline of primal fear. <clears throat> but those are the moments when I, um, when I'm anchored in those teachings or the ideas of my friends that I connect with. Like, for example, when you said, uh, we're all on a roller coaster and we're not allowed to get off just enjoy the ride so i take that for me that means from birth onwards you know from the time that i exist to the time that i go and pass on which is my physical reality that i know that i'm perceiving i'm on a roller coaster and i'm never in control and i'm not in charge when i actually we i think of it this way i wasn't even in charge of when i got on this roller coaster because when we're born we are we don't choose i mean maybe we do because the spiritual teachings will say yes you have you have had this contract i get that but if we're going to talk about the physicalness of life in my limited <clears throat> understanding of my physical self i know that i i just i was born and i don't know how i you know i don't know how i came through so for me, that's, I didn't choose when I was going to born and to whom and through the parents that I have. So that means I got on the roller coaster without giving permission. So I'm not in control to begin with. Then I have to live the, the physical finite life that I have given till I pass on. And that's the end of my roller coaster journey. So this is what I take away from when you say that. And every time something difficult happens, I would anchor myself in that and say, hang on a minute, before you react, you're on a roller coaster, right? You're not in control of anything. So my response matters more than how I react. So these are beautiful ways of, um, like these are tools for us to manage our limited physical, the sen you know, in the sense of physical um, abilities, dealing with challenges for example and um i think i do understand the power like we are powerful and i do resonate with what you said uh, swan earlier you said we are actually more fearful of our power than our you know more because we're more afraid that we are more you know powerful than we're not um i do resonate with that but i I find it very difficult to be in that or at least um, feel it in my bones every time, like every moment. Um, there is this tendency to slip back into the baseline primal survival mode. So, yeah, I, I'm in this, you know, I think we all are in this dilemma or duality of, yes, I am powerful, but then I am powerless. I am powerful and I'm not powerless. So it's like a dance between the power and powerless and um and detachment is the biggest understanding concept that i've been practicing maybe similar to you that like the example you gave the krishnamurti when he said the highest intelligence is not to 
to, to, to observe without evaluation. That's a very tricky game, tricky conditioning. It's almost like conditioning, programming for us. It's very difficult to just observe without interfering with our own limitations or conditioning or programming. But, um, but detachment helps me with that a lot. I don't know how you feel about detachment. So even with um, knowing that I'm powerful, but also not powerful, the only thing helps me enjoy the dance is the detachment of, yes, I am powerful, but I'm detached. I'm okay with being powerful. I am powerless. I'm also detached. I'm okay with being very physical and limited at the same time. So that, that gives me a whole vast understanding of just sit here and observe. Just be with it. Just be with it. And uh, also stops the narratives, the stories, you know, the games that we play. So and so did this, and so and so, and and even like economical, political, with the COVID going on right now. Um, sometimes I question myself: What is it that I am so detached? Because I speak to some of my other friends; they are very engaged in the, actively engaged in the COVID situation. You know, the conditioning they call it pandemic. But I feel like I'm so detached that I almost feel numb to it, dissociative from it. And um, this doesn't mean I don't care. I'm just practicing detachment because whatever this COVID is, is or whatever that, you know, it's happening right now, one, obviously, I'm in this time, I must have chosen to be here, or at least there is some plan behind this. And if it isn't, if there isn't a plan, then I'm okay with that too, because it's not in my control. All I can do is manage my own state. And we go back to earlier what you said. If I can lead myself, if I can lead, and if I can be enough, and if I can be conscious of my consumism, my behavior towards materialistic world, if I can be happy with very minimalist, you know, being a minimalist and also having the basic needs, then I think I'm doing my part in a way. I don't know. How do you feel about that? Doing our part in this economical, you know, political chaos that is, you know, we are observing outside of us. Mm. Well, I mean, so Einstein is quoted and I mean, I, you know, so you can have various opinions about Einstein as, you know, but he he's quoted for saying we cannot solve the problems at the same level of consciousness as the problems were created. And I think we are on this cusp of, um, I mean, I'm a little bit reluctant to go into too much into kind of like like narratives as they are, because it's like, but there is this kind of, there seems to be this, it's called the Hegelian dialective of problem, reaction, and solution. And it's kind of, it's becoming a bit old hat, isn't it? Because it's like, <laughs> you know, we, we've had all these wars, so we had the war on Tara that seems to create more Tara. <laughs> you had the war on drugs, but it was kind of, it was more like a war on consciousness, wasn't it really that war? Because some, you know, some drugs are more equal than others, I mean. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, so where do you kind of in this kind of thing that's going on there's a bigger context you know we live in a in a maturing universe you know the mature the universe is evolving as well like i just but like um i like that what you said actually maturing yeah, it's a maturing universe but like uh 
So, I mean, so like if I look at, for instance, the Resonance Science Academy with the Shinghara Mine and these kind of people, they're talking about this. We're coming from this very kind of disconnected. It's also inspired by Newtonian science, et cetera, where everything is kind of seen as very mechanical and, and our bodies are like, you know, but like, so we're coming from this kind of like, like, so I love medical science. I think medical science has got a lot to, to a lot of good have brought into the world. I think psychology is wonderful. I think seeing from a, an emotional perspective is fantastic i think it's also very necessary to have an economic and financial understanding of resources the world etc cetera, etc cetera. but where it's like when people come just from one angle and you know i love people who work within film and television media you know journalists etc cetera, etc cetera. but where it's like if if we just come from one viewpoint and that's where Nishing Haramani, he, he, says, he, does, he says things like, the universe doesn't distinguish, distinguish. It doesn't say, oh, this is bio, biology, this is chemistry, this is physics, this is quantum physics, this is, you know, this is, this is, you know, so we need to, div as, as human beings, as, as a species of whatever we are, we need to create a holistic, unified, world view a vision of and and i like like the shinghai mine i mean in one sense i'm kind of like a little bit like i i see people and i i i i admire what they do so we'll repeat it because it makes sense and i think it's important like if we quit so what we got with this hegelian dialectic we got a lot of these division programs so it's kind of like you you're asked basically so so that means you 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 create a problem then you socially engineer a reaction, and then you bring in the the solution. And it's like, I mean, it's becoming pretty uh, emperor's new clothes, isn't it? Like, I think a majority of people can see it now. It's not like a minority who sees like this thing. It's like a vast, you know, it's like a lot of people who go like, hello, <laughs> we've seen this so many times before. We're kind of a bit, you know, but what do you do? So you, then you 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 gotta like you know also we're coming out of the age of Pisces. We're coming into the age of Aquarius. You know we are, but it's almost like like what I've heard. Like when the light becomes really strong, then the shadow accelerates. So that's where the maturing. If we are in this maturing universe, and there's actually an influx of light. It's almost as like the shadow is accelerating to the extent it's coming like a it's like a blitzkrieg, isn't it? Like it's like you know. But what where I'm kind of putting my without being, I'm not focusing my energy on that. I'm focusing my energy on the what is real, which is nature. It's the nature. It's the resource that, that nature provides us. It's 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 you know natural compounds within nature it's like what you are like you're talking about biohacking and and kind of it's like you know and it's just people who are now like i think if there's something good about everything that's happening for me anyway it's like i am not going to keep up an appearance of who i am i'm not going to pretend to be anything more or anything else than what i actually am i want to be authentic i want to be real for me less is more like um there was one thing i saw it's it's a long time ago but i i've i've been thinking about it a lot and there's kind of like so it was, it was a it was a a, uh, a webinar about money and, and I'm, I'm quite interested in money and how money works etc but these women and there were women who have collected millions of dollars for projects in amazon like good fundraising you know very able women and they were speaking about this they said there's three toxic myths about wealth and abundance and one is the scarcity myth there isn't enough 
that's pretty much built into also the the source code of this kind of <laughs> dimension we unfortunately find ourselves in but that is a is a blatant lie and if you think about again with a like astronomical there's 275 million new stars birthed every single day you know you know we can go into more of that kind of stuff but there there is scarcity is a lie then the second myth that they said is more is better and the third is that's just the way it is but the more is better for instance they mentioned the example that in the united states of america the biggest one of the biggest industries was storage you know so basically imagine people have bought all this stuff <laughs> talk about suffocation you know the, the the age of suffocation so accumulate more is better less more like and then you know you actually you can't use all of the stuff because your time is limited so you actually put it into storage i mean <laughs> you know talk about like wasting resources i mean so i think there's a time now of letting go like i'm getting rid of stuff that i don't need i'm letting it go i'm sending it on like i want to end suffocation you know i don't need any more like possessions i i i want to limit i want to have more time to sit and meditate and do nothing so like if i don't feel constantly that you know so it's kind of like come into this personally i think small can be beautiful i don't think necessarily like i think unfortunately like with culture there's so much that's kind of embedded in culture this whole idea that more is better for instance so you constantly need to you know get more clients for instance and you need to like expand and like you know but you see what's happening whether you like whatever kind of explanation you invest in that's what's going on seems to be that systems that are unsustainable you know yeah completely yeah. unsustainable they collapse and it goes like boom it's like this whole stack of cards is coming down you know like you know are you surprised i'm not really surprised but what i would like to to get back to my own sense of self and and do things that make sense to me and you know i think having a consensus like we are having right now is like sometimes it's good to uh to face the shadows something like and, and i think that's what we're doing collectively we have to face so but instead of me instead of me going out there like there's a nietzsche quote that i like that if if you fight monsters you have to be very careful not to become a monster in the process yeah. <laughs> of fighting monsters so i think it's quite easy and it's one thing that's good that those people who used to rule from the shadow it's kind of you can follow the money you can do the investigative journalism you can follow the money and you can see a lot of people like that are you know engineering all this kind of stuff and you can kind of go oh they're the bad guys but you know what i'd rather do i'd rather look at my own shadow and i'd rather do my own work and i'd rather kind of you know that that i think that's more empowering because also when we dare to look at our own you know that's where we find the real power that's when we can go inside our shadow self and then find the light and then actually you know there's 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 a lot of power and there's a lot of good in the shadow and that's kind of the, that's the work i'm doing and that's the reason i'm kind of withdrawing and i'm that's where i'm spending my time but uh there's a lot of like so for instance in this period of i've pretty much been in solitude I use the word solitude rather than isolation, but I've pretty much been with myself for a year, you know, <laughs> celebrating <laughs> that I've been able to, to kind of be with myself. I mean, I have been out in the world a little bit, but not very much, you know, been in Wild West in the in the nature and Wales. And, but I was studying this quite, it's a, it's a psychological work, but it's it's the king, the warrior, the magician and the lover you know and it talks about the archetypes of the masculine and 
I think there's also this, we've lived in patriarchal cultures and patriarch, and we can see what's patriarchal religion and we can see all the kind of the the terrible <laughs> disaster you know it's it's you know but there is that kind of like so there is a recalibration of the masculine feminine that will have to happen because that's what system does automatically they recalibrate and they go towards the dynamic equilibrium and when things are so out of whack and so out of balance you know there is a system like there is a the system will kind of restore or uh you know but i've been thinking a lot about so so for instance with my like so i you know my acting career was quite quite frankly it's like i was doing inner child work and i was doing inner teenager work <laughs> and i happened to do some of these things in productions etc and some of it you know and then i was you know background at productions i always had this i wanted to find a way of infiltrating that industry that was kind of my look you know they couldn't mm -hmm. see me coming this kind of anyway so but uh but so now i want to kind of address and that's kind of on my little you know so from a point of view of of i want to address the masculine and so when you got so you got for instance the king so you got these archetypes so you got the just king the righteous king and then you also got on the shadow of the pyramid of that you got the despot or the or you know the the tyrant you know and i think we can see that in the field you know that there's very little of the just kind of righteous royalty kind of left i mean i wouldn't want to say anything that could you know <laughs> we can cut edit this out but like you know i think uh and then we we when we talk about the warrior then we also like the principle of the spiritual warrior that you know it, it dynamic you know and you know that's both fe male and female isn't you have you you've got to find the warrior within yourself you know uh, but there's the, the there's the there's the warrior and then there's the kind of the the, the psychopathic killer and the you know all these shadowy flip and then you got the the magician then you got the you got the pure magic and then you got the kind of the sociopath and you got the you know they've got the politician or the blatant con man you know i mean <laughs> and we're saying with the lover you got like you know you got and then you got the twisted kind of like watching pornography is not the same as being a lover you know having <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean it's like so so that's kind of where i'm looking to take my my uh, kind of artistic work to embody like a real like i'm interested in what does it actually mean to be a man because also that's you know where we talk about like for instance vulnerability is a great strength but you got to choose who you're vulnerable with. You got to know. You got to be discerning. You can't be vulnerable just with anybody. Right. But like, but that's where we come back to this kind of the light and the like. My power, like, so there's power in being vulnerable, for instance, mm -hmm. be, being real, being authentic. And I think there has to be this kind of. It is the childlike innocence that says, "The emperor has no clothes on." Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many? Yeah how many people are going along with this you know you know yeah. a like a it's a circus isn't it it's a circus i mean mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. like a, a soap opera and people are just going along you know and there has to come a time where people just go like no not anymore <laughs> yeah it's a it's a difficult one it's a difficult one i think we're all practicing that slowly okay we'll get into get into that and there's so many things you said I want to go back a little bit if you don't mind um, you talked about light I mean you talked about the uh, maturing universe when you know the planets and the earth has its own ev evolution process and right now somehow there is um, we are kind of becoming more conscious. We are questioning more. 
um, maybe you understanding concepts that we couldn't understand before. Maybe this is my own illusion because I can be like that because this is why I I perceive the world as as I am. Or maybe it's not. Maybe the world was like this all the time because you know if you look back at, for you know last millennia there was esoteric uh, philosophies and teachings and mysticism existed ever since we know human you know as human existence so it's been a it's been part of our consciousness and i'm thinking could it be that the more i'm becoming conscious in this time i am seeing the world as becoming or going i i also interpret this as okay i'm actually maturing consciously so i see as this is a collective thing maybe i don't know i always question that um and i do also i don't dismiss the fact that experiencing something like covid is biblical it's seriously it's one of those things that probably once in a lifetime maybe not even it's a biblical experience and um, and you're right I actually use that quote a couple of times you know the brighter the light the deeper the shadows I feel like that's true too because um, right now through pandemic through isolation solitude we've been invited to to take refuge in solitude and get to know ourselves it's confronted the relationship within ourselves relationship with people i know so many people are divorcing separating breaking up i know so many people going into depression because i feel like depression the spike in depression also um resembles you know when you have a chaotic divorce you know the the two people go eat each side and they kind of separate their ways but when you are confronted with your own dysfunction it always manifests in depression or something like that because you can't run away from yourself you know at least when you're in a relationship that both partners can just kind of you know separate their ways but when you are confronted deeply you can't do that so therefore a lot of things are manifesting right now with people panic attacks anxiety is higher than ever and um, but ultimately you know we are being called to do some work right and that's what you said earlier and the more i can go into my own self work and take refuge in solitude the more i become aware and the more i can lead myself and claim self agency i feel like um sometimes i can't help but think we're like a lab rats in this you know we're put in this place and feels like you know you know some like lab rats they get some treats when they do the right thing they get a little treat i feel like the more we do deep shadow work or self work we get a little treat and then it takes us to the next level it's crazy i just can't help myself to think of this as a game and um, and uh, there was this i don't know if you read or remember the story of the alchemist the very famous book from Paula Kala I think his name is um so the alchemist is actually a shepherd a young shepherd probably adolescent I don't know not teenager though for sure maybe I don't know I can't remember now it's 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 a, it's a while ago and he used to lie down on a really beautiful rock and watch the sky and look at the stars and question and um I think he set out to um travel to look for treasure or something while you know he was questioning this process of life existence and you know finding treasure and things like that and then he goes around traveling the world and then through his travels he becomes really mature he becomes strong resilient he learns about rejection love loss um and then eventually he has a you know deep breakthroughs where he become he becomes an alchemist he speaks to the gods the wind the, you know it's crazy how the story evolves and then eventually eventually 
he retracts. He let he he learns to let go. And like you said earlier in the beginning of our conversation, he becomes less and less and less and less of what he became. And he comes back to the same point. And then he lies down to look at the stars again. But this time, very different place from a very different perspective and viewpoint. And then something comes to him and, and to lift the rock, he lifts the rock, guess what? All along there's been a treasure there. But he had to go around the world and experience all of that to come back to that point again. I think it's such a great metaphor for life, for us um, in self-work. I feel this is what we're doing. And each time we come back to the same point with a higher perspective, a different viewpoint, a little bit detached, a bit more open and less critical, less judgment. And it's just, just like shedding layers of that you know, conditioning. It's crazy. That's how I look at the um, game of self-work. And then we get rewarded each time we have when we have the courage to take that you know solitude the invitation for the work i feel like we've always been rewarded by um you know becoming less attached so that we no longer hurt so much you know the pain the suffering the illusion because the emotional attachment is crazy and i think this is the game we're in and um I always question this, like, what is the point of all this? What is the point of me being here and experiencing all these people and experiencing all these relationships and the losses? And it's like the alchemist book, you know? I'm on a journey into becoming mature. So, so what you said earlier resonated a lot, the maturing universe. And I always believe, well, then that means it's inside me too. If What's in the macro is in the micro, and then what's in the micro, it's in the macro. I feel like I'm living all the stuff inside of me, and then the macro is reflecting that back to me. That's how I kind of measure where I am with my self work too. It's quite complex, actually. So I don't expect you to get all of that, what I'm saying, but um, does it make sense? <laughs> Um, well, it's, we, we have to go within, I mean, this is agreed by esoteric wisdom, philosophy, like only to go within, you will find the universe within, you'll find the, you'll find, so this is what Nishing Haramind, these kind of people are saying. We are ultimately, we are the universe looking back at itself. And like, we don't see the world as the world is. We see the world as we are, you know. And so it is kind of take accepting responsibility. Accepting responsibility for have, having come into this world, you know. I think when healing, any kind of healing, there's the spiral. So you kind of come around and you you thought, oh, I dealt with that, you know, and then you feel it again. And I haven't quite dealt with it, but you get to revisit and you get, and it's, you know, we're all trauma, we're all traumatized, we're all wounded. I mean, you and I wouldn't have this conversation if we weren't wounded <laughs> at some time in our life. But that wound then becomes our, our gift that is the empathy that you know because i felt the pain i can feel it and you know i do believe that to some extent if you can feel it you can heal it we have to feel uh, it's painful isn't it i mean it's painful uh you know you and i we've talked about this and i think many people will relate to this we're going through this death process of the old world and we're we're in this grief of the old world you know the old world where you could go out and have a cup of coffee and it wasn't like <laughs> mm -hmm. it was okay know. to do that 
and you know it was, it was like the, the old world was wasn't like you know so so we there's this grief so we we go into the the de, de, de denial you know i'm 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 you know this can't like i had it for a year pretty much susan i was like this cannot be happening it's like this is i call it the surreality i this is not happening it's 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 just a, and the, some people were thinking oh it's going to be a couple of months and you know but so there's the denial then there's you know there is the anger you know the outrage you know how you know you know <laughs> and you know of course people are going to you know, depression it's obvious you know it's like you know and uh the bargaining you know yeah the all stages of the grieving grieving process mm -hmm. and and then you got the acceptance but like it's it is there's a part of of what you there's a part of that letting go you know and i think we have to like we can find solace and we can observe nature everything in nature is cyclic you know there is a uh, an an inception gestation. There's a there's a birthing. There's a there's kind of maturing, and then there's an ultimately a, a death. You know, and and that death. You know, so behind all this fear, fear really is the fear of change, isn't it? Ultimately, and that ultimately behind all this, there's the fear of death, which is the ultimate change. If you deal with the fear of death, you can pretty much handle everything, isn't it? I absolutely <laughs> believe this is the truth. If we can just handle the fact that we're mortal beings and we are here in this physical, finite ex existence, I think none of the trivial things that we engage in won't matter anymore. None. Zero. We won't be participating in those trivial you know mundane and stuff that keeps us um in places that we don't we shouldn't be and um so can we agree that um whether it's pandemic or not because pandemic is actually a, an amazing uh, example of um maturing letting go grieving it and accepting it because um, with pandemic process, if you take this as an opportunity, because you can for sure see it as one of the worst things that ever happened to you, or you can take it as this one of the brilliant things that ever happened to you in terms of your evolution, which I did take that as that, because I think um, this one year of pandemic has probably the, the momentum, the deepness and the induced um the forcefulness of the self-work the invitation is so strong and alluring and it's like you can't even say no because here you are confronted with it i think it's been a blessing and so coming back to like especially with it's taken me so far deep um, that I was saying to a couple of my friends that I think I am confronting my mortality lately. I think I'm in that process of really confronting that. And I know this is kind of like a higher level of deep work, like you said earlier. If you can accept that, you can deal with anything. And um, I feel like, you know, let's just forget about the esoteric teachings of the gurus, the mystics, and you know, everyone in, uh, that we are aware of. And just let's, if we was to just simplify life, like you said earlier with the nature, you know, you look at the flower, you know, there is a birth, then matures, blooms and dies. I think the, the life that, you know, we're given is meant to be like that. We're born, you know, we kind of thrive, mature, learn, experience, and die. And that's it. And one of my authors, Caroline Mace, she always says, life is impersonal. Stop taking it personally. Stop taking it personally. Just humble down. You are part of the collective intelligence, the, the, the law of the nature. Just because you are human and you have consciousness and you have this arrogance, 
doesn't make you any separate. You are part of that death, you know, thriving and then maturing and dying. I think nature is the same. And <clears throat> if we were to just take it that way, and you might say, okay, then what about all those people who never accept this process? Because the I feel I know you come from a somatic kind of studies and place and I feel like the biggest challenge for us humans is accepting death, number one, that one day we will disappear and we will just be left in the memories of those we encountered. <clears throat> that's number one. I think that's the biggest fear. And then secondly, all those things, you know, we experience in the developmental years or the like Stan Groff talks about perinatal, the birth of trauma and all of that. Um, somehow, you know, those wire us in a way that stops us, it stops the evolutionary process, if you know what I mean. So it stops the, the cycle of that natural cycle. So we we become so disconnected from this cycle. So instead of you know, growing, learning, maturing, and dying, we are stuck in one phase, fixated on one wound or a trauma or a detachment. Our body gets old, we become, you know, we grow, we, you know, we're maturing physically, but psychologically, we're so fixated on that one thing that happened to us in our lives. And that's it. That we take that to grave. We're so stuck and fixated on maybe a family drama, maybe a loss at a young age, maybe, um, you know, abuse, maybe, um, not that I'm dismissing any of this because these are horrific, but somehow human beings have the capability to be fixated on that one event or multiple events that can, it can literally change the path rewires us to something else it, you know we're so fixated like i said it just stops the natural evolution and um, it's quite scary actually and we know lots of people like that i was like that i always say that was my previous life in my previous life that's what i did i was fixated with one thing and i kept chasing that same thing knowing that each time I'll get into the same thing, same experience, only to collapse again. And I'm like, imagine there are so many of us in this world that take that to the grave. You know, it's quite sad. What are your thoughts on, on that? I think it's... I think it's possible, Susan, to to develop skills like being empathic with oneself, accepting, and then ultimately what you're talking about here is the power of being able to forgive, you know, forgive others, forgive ourselves, you know, we're the core we're innocent we can get caught up in these dramas you know but that the core every single one of us and this is every single being and marshall rosenberg and my study of him and you I, I say to people like i'm not saying what i'm speaking about here as you're speaking it's for people to research and do their own work and do their own study and do you know that like we can't you know but like what he says, Marshall Rosenberg, in this nonviolent communication, he says, all human behavior is an attempt to meet a need. And I mean, that resonates. And, and so every single one of us, you know, in the depths of our despair, we've always attempted to meet a need, you know, and similarly other people are attempting to meet a need. And sometimes that way <laughs> is not the most, it's not the right, you know, it's, you know, it's something that causes pain to other beings, which is not okay. Yeah. But, but that's, you know, 
I, uh, you know, and it's it's all it's almost impossible to break them out of this. Like myself, like um, I don't know about your experience, but how do we break out of that? Like not because a lot of people who are fixated or stuck in that place, they don't realize how they are impacting others. Well, themselves first because it's very dysfunctional for their own evolution, but they they also not aware of how they are impacting other people and how much they are inflicting suffering on other people. It's a bit like um I think it was the it was it was it Jim Carrey he said um the whole family revolves or the whole family is organized around the most um, dysfunctional member of the family so um like the whole family unit is organized around that one dysfunctional or traumatized or at least uh, that person who expresses a lot of you know pain and suffering out to the world is um organized around a person but i think it doesn't need to be in a family because we meet those people we allow those people in our lives and we might be that person but somehow, I was that person, I put my hand up, I was that person inflicting that level of suffering to other people. But when you're there, you are too much in your victim mindset, you don't know you're doing this. That's why I call it my previous life. Um, you don't know how much you are inflicting pain on others because you are too immersed in your own victimized reality you just so immersed in it you think the whole world is out to get you and that you know you become so righteous so entitled so arrogant so you know all of these things that the shell becomes so thick like you need the hammer to really like hack into that bubble to crack it open so i can see what i'm doing it's crazy, right? And um, that's why um, when it comes to somatic experiencing, especially if people carry this trauma, as you know, and um, one of the things that we always talk about, the nervous system, like how do you crack someone open to realize where they are stuck? Because, you know, forgiveness, I, I thought, you know, when I first uh, jumped into the self-development space, first two things, learn no three actually learn to say affirmations positive affirmations learn to practice gratitude and learn to forgive yourself and others i thought i thought what a load of rubbish <laughs> so this is a person coming from a victim mindset what a load of rubbish you know i'm going to say good affirmations about my you know messed up life everyone is ruining my life so i can't say affirmations that are positive because it seemed so it seems like i was um lying to myself it's cheating and then gratitude like gratitude for what everyone ever done to me is to cause pain and abandon me and do wrong and then forgive yourself why should I forgive myself? People should take ownership and they should own what they did to me. I can't forgive them and I can't. Like, I don't, I have nothing to forgive myself because I'm so righteous. You see the dilemma here? So how do we crack this person open to realize, hey, you have no idea what you're fixated on. And, and this person like refuses to do the work, refuses to see it another way. Like I get people wanting to work with me and they say, it's my partner. Can we work together to fix her? So we're going to work together to fix him or her, right? Do you see where the problem is? Um, well, I mean, Yeah, well, again, coming from the point of view of nonviolent communications, Susan, it's like, uh, so 
it, I'm not just about Marshall Rosenberg, but like one thing he said, like he went through decades of education and he was never once asked what is his need. So for us to learn to express openly what our needs are, you know, that takes some education, isn't it? Yeah. And what I've been thinking about, because I aspire, and I'm only aspiring, I'm not saying I'm there, and you know, but I aspire for emotional maturity, and I aspire to make most of my decisions based on emotional intelligence, and I invest in my own emotional well-being. That's my, like, I spend my money on something that makes me feel emotionally better you know my own emotional well-being that's my primary area of where i work towards feeling better emotionally and uh i've been thinking a lot about this and what you're talking about really is is you know you're talking about the drama triangle isn't it you know where you got this embedded rescuer first of all it's not our business what anybody else does <laughs> you know like first principle of business robert kiyosaki would say is to mind your own business you know it's none of my business what anybody else does but if there is any of this like so i just personally this is my if if i disengage if there's something that appears toxic to me i don't like you know i just walk and i keep walking <laughs> and i don't <laughs> like i don't look i don't look back i disengage i don't engage in drama as such mm -hmm. But, Obviously, the examples I gave, they're like extreme examples, right? <laughs> yes, but this, this yeah. Um, I mean, I've just, in my journey, I've just looked into so many different kind of ways. of. But I think we've got within family constellations, for instance, there is this kind of, you have a starting gate position so you we're all kind of born into a family system and some will you know like older siblings generally become either the rescuer or the the persecutor a, a second child usually takes the victim role of the family the problem child mm -hmm. and you know there are these kind of you know I think a process, what is it like process is like Jung would say the process of life is to make the, the unconscious conscious. Mm -hmm. we, we have to become, we have to work consciously to understand what subconscious, what drives up subconsciously. We have to kind of be kind of aware that, you know, we are only like the top of the iceberg. What is drivers? It's like, you know, there's so much playing into this whole, you know, ancestral, all sorts of patterns. And it's just kind of get into some kind of realization that, you know, a path, a part of my healing is to surrender and it's to surrender to what is, you know, yeah, I'm never going to fix the external, and some of that surrender might uh, might have to like when I change the way I look at things, the things I look at change. Yeah. If I'm putting my energy on fixing and changing somebody else, like Gestalt therapy would say from the first, you can never change any, you can never change anybody. You know, you what you can do is you can remove yourself from the situation. And the dynamics may change. You, you may, I may change, but I can never change anybody else. The, the most, the first, my first encounter with uh, personal development was actually Gestalt therapy, and within that, there is a, it's called the paradoxical theory of change. Mm -hmm. If you got something about yourself that you really don't like, and you really, you know, like a habit or. A, the more you can accept it, the more you can love it, the more there's a chance that you can actually change and you can stop doing that thing. But mm -hmm. it is that paradoxical. When we resist something, we it becomes stronger. And similarly, because you're mentioning the somatic, and I think it's really, really important because I think 
what a lot of people like myself included i've gone on this path of so-called spirituality and it's really like a disassociated trauma out of body kind of thing going for the light but kind of forgetting the shadow and then now like because at some point when we were wounded it didn't feel safe for us to be in our bodies yeah. and now it's like the somatic experience is coming back into your body yeah. and like really being in your body and for instance so i was like my my journey is my setting out on this kind of quest but meeting certain people on my path and that has imparted something for instance i met a a fantastic uh, body worker called stanley rosenberg he lived in copenhagen at that time he's a very old man and but his work is accessing the healing powers of the vagus nerve and he's worked with Stephen Porges and these various about the polyvagal theory, etc. But literally had 50 years of embodied experience in these practices. And uh, That's beautiful. and I had an experience working with him. And first he was doing things on me, and and then he was allowing me to do the things on him. And he said, he said, You spent many years in meditation, didn't you? And I said, Yes, I did. And he said, It's come in you know you are in the moment you are there you are present and and what he showed me is that it is so little it is so gentle pressure but what it what we are actually working towards is is allowing our nervous system to re-stabilize itself and that's that like we can never do anything to anything unless we resource unless we resource ourselves and then we unless we're so learning to love is basically learning to love oneself first you know and uh one thing he said also like i read in his book recently and i was saying like you might have a child and the child may say i'm scared and the parent might say there's nothing to be afraid of which may be true and it might like you know but if the parent can say to the child, I hear you, I hear your fear, I can, you know, I sense how frightened you are. And, you know, yeah. that is so much more powerful because you are validating the emotion. And if we can do that to ourselves, you know, yeah. our, inner, our inner children, you are, you're scared shitless, aren't you? <laughs> and there's good reason to be, Susan. There's good reason to be, a, we are, all i think on our core is very base chakra threats of survival that we're kind of faced with you know we're all you know so yeah we've got to learn to nurture and honor our own inner child and our own and that's where the healing is that you know what happened to me you know to say we're all victims to some extent but what, what what we do choose to take responsibility to evolve from this victimhood into a co-creator you know i want to co-create something good so for that i do need to i need to get my values in place isn't it i mean i we're having some a very interesting conversation here but it, it all we all got to bring it back to self isn't it we got to bring it back to mm -hmm. yeah all of these, you know, teachings, esoteric and mystical or psychological, you know, holistic. Um, I love the somatic experiencing, the concept. I love the vagus nerve, how children, you know, I think understanding the nervous system, how the trauma is held, it was life-changing for me to realize, oh, my God. That's when I realized that... Um, you know, there is a saying that the body is the unconscious. I kind of believe it is because sometimes the mind understands and, you know, it's quite intelligent, you know, it gets the concepts, but it's very, very difficult to embody it. Like what we know, we can't actually embody it because, and that's because the nervous system dysregulation, some of these fears and, you know, on a cellular level, which is so true. And, um, I feel like validating ourselves is something we've not been taught. 
and that's something I had to learn, especially this year. I think the the more we go into the deep work, the more we learn that it's okay to be scared because we are all afraid. And the more I and you know one of the biggest eye opening things, the epiphany for me, the more I dive into my deep self work, the more I realize I'm so afraid, and the more I realize I'm afraid. I know everyone is afraid too. So the judgment just kind of disappears. So when I see people walking around, I used to, when I was in my you know, spiritual bypassing times, I used to always judge and, and say, the arrogance was always there. And I say, oh, all these people are asleep. You know that one? All of these people are asleep. Um, but now I'm like, no, 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 no. They are not asleep. They are afraid. They're afraid. I think there's always layers to understanding how people behave when they're afraid and, and how they are attached to things to distract themselves. Because this thing is damn hard, you know, facing our own selves. Uh, one of my favorite quote is, um, meeting yourself is the biggest event you'll ever have or attend. It's true. It's so painful. Of course, you're going to find Netflix, download Netflix, download Gaia, <clears throat> immersed in esoteric philosophy, you know, intellectual concepts. Why not? Because um, it helps and eases the pain and the fear and being afraid of not knowing. And um, I think the biggest gift that came through the pandemic is being okay with not knowing being okay with not understanding what's happening. And I don't, I kind of let go of wanting to understand and also accepting that maybe we'll, we're not meant to know in this lifetime. That's why this physical existence is about trusting, trusting the un unfolding, trusting the unfolding. And earlier you said to be with what is. I think we're learning. <clears throat> I think we're becoming more mature and mature with the lightness. Like um, when we began talking, you said, I want to go back to that lightness, the innocence, the innocence of a childlike spirit. <clears throat> I think we are slowly kind of going to that direction, I find. Yeah. And uh, as we are coming back, uh, end of our conversation, Let's talk about, because the one thing we didn't talk about is your years in acting. Um, I'm sure it's done so much. It added, probably added so much richness and character into your life and the way you view the world. I always wondered what it's like to, to look at the world through the actor's eyes. Maybe you can say some things for us on that. I, I'm not a trained actor as such, Susan. I, I had a desire to reinvent my life through acting, and I did, and I I had so much fun with what I did. <laughs> I had so much fun. And, you know, again, it was a matter of me, like, using my... You know, I have a real desire for edu like educating myself and learning, but I equate for me study means having fun. So and it's kind of gaining skills, experience, and then opportunities. So I think destiny presented me with some very interesting opportunities where I could kind of uh, comment on so on social things like. I was cast in some things that gave me the chance to talk about self-medication and suicide awareness, and depression, and and uh, then I did some very fun kind of. There's one role I was cast for this music video, and it's called "Someone Say Something," and I act like this wacky Scandinavian dance therapist and. 
basically I didn't have to do much acting <laughs> basically to be myself. but it was so much fun and uh and then I did a Bowie tribute as well which was around my relationship with my dad and growing up in you know the 80s 70s kind of and this whole walking down memory lane that was so much fun but for me it was always like reframing it's like one thing that fascinates me around is which what really gravitate gravitated me towards that realm apart from my significance drive which is obviously there as well <laughs> but uh there's a there seems to be a in my understanding anyway there's universal film language and the subconscious pretty much operate in the same you've got flashbacks and you got flash forwards and similarly with the subconscious you got flashbacks and you got flash forwards so for instance brian tracy who is one teacher that i did kind of personal development but he said if you can worry you can visualize so that's kind of what happens when we we're triggered we go we we flash back to a time in our lives where we're disempowered we're traumatized and we see something dangerous like for the lizard everything is black and white you only see looking for danger really you know so you think oh this looks a bit like what happened in the past so you start worrying and that's actually the the brain and you're you're trying to do something about the problem what's the problem with that is that you kind of rob yourself of being in the moment and you rob yourself of being in the in the in the present but yeah and then i was when i was working on these big productions i was on aladdin will smith i met him there i you know then i'm thinking what can i do within that industry that promotes more value then i i've always had a desire to work as a massage therapist as well and i live in west wales and i have a great network here so i decided i wanted to train get the skills of that and then i would offer that within the film and television industry then i'm thinking you know if i could connect the healing network that i've got you know and i could connect those to actors performers and film and television personality that would be a real way of influencing the field so that's kind of where my acting career kind of ended and i kind of went in so i've always had this desire as my biggest like i have no idea how this would ever come across you know i but basically i want the world of healing and well-being to be connected with the world of film and television because like i know you got certain things you're working towards that you would like like the right to take certain medicines etc the right to influence you know like i think if we could as a culture like i think having mental health problems is a very logical and you know a consequence of living in a in a civilization that is quite frankly like bonkers you know i think having mental health problems is like a symptom of health also <laughs> like, uh -huh. Yeah, a little bit joking but i think instead of t talking about having mental health problems if we could tr talk about emotional well-being yeah and we could really establish that it's like isn't it quite like for the simple like for the childlike innocent there's a correspondence because how i feel emotionally mm -hmm. and I and my physical well-being isn't it it's kind of like common sense <laughs> but it's like it seems like in this world we almost have to back common sense science like there's a correspondence between how i feel about myself emotionally and physically energetically and my financial well-being isn't it you know Absolutely. let's get back to like common sense let's talk about a holistic let's have a holistic perspective let's look at the whole let's let's look at emotional well-being and and that's where kind of my aspirations would lie for mm -hmm. what if we could all embed this idea that 
investing in my emotional well-being is the most important investment I can ever make. Wouldn't uh, that wouldn't that make a positive change? Like I can buy anything in the world and I can still be unhappy. <laughs> absolutely. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So mm -hmm. if I if I can anything I do in my life, I personally I invest in my emotional well-being. I invest in connections. Uh, I, I care about communication. I care about relationships. I educate myself in those. Like, how can you ever learn anything? How can you master anything unless you enter a process where you're actually admitting yourself in a school? You know. So there's a for me. There's also humility, like, yeah. and being a student. I'll always be a student. I I always I want to gravitate towards people where I feel I can learn something. And what I look is, do they embody? Do they embody peace? You know, because you, because if they talk about peace and peace and peace, but actually, I can sense they're angry and they're like, you know, they're not petite. I need somebody who can really walk and embody their talk. That's kind of where I'm I'm at. You know. Oh my god, this is so amazing. That's probably this is the truth bomb of this conversation. We all have a responsibility to learn from those who are able to embody what they preach. And in society that we're in, with this technology, digital age, unfortunately, a lot of people can present themselves as influencers, as experts in something. But somehow we are so disconnected from ourselves that we are, we can be, open for manipulation and also i find that especially if if we are not emotionally invested in ourselves and we are continually driven by the unconscious desires and chase the thing whatever that is it's different for everyone and we come from that desperation i think we fall into those traps we fall into the promises of a guru fixing us and healing us in 48 hours or you know you know you know all of these processes like it's almost comical that you know we have so many experts out there claiming to be expert in something but People like you who are so intuitively strong, because I I find that do you remember the treats that we talked about earlier? The more we go into the self-work, the pain and facing ourselves, we always get a little treat. And that treat for me has been expanding in my intuition. The more I grow in my intuition, the more I can then make discerning decisions. Who I want to learn from, who do I want to listen, whose book do I want to read? Who do I resonate with? It becomes much more simple and easy for me to connect to. Looking back five, six, even, even say four years ago, I would put people on pedal stall. I would chase that thing because all of that was coming from a des desperation, from a place of survival, place of wanting something now. Um, somehow, even the most, you know, famous influencers, they don't actually say, you know, this thing you want will take time. The thing that I'm selling to you is a lifelong process, but they rather say, come to my, you know, class and in three steps, you master this and master that and master this, right? It's easily, it's easily, you know, done because we all fall for those traps and then it becomes a, a painful lesson. Um, unfortunately, still a lot of people don't realize this and I still meet daily because, you know, being a coach, I was a coach for London Real for years and I remember I still now get messages from people saying, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this course, I've done this course, now I want to do London Real course. And can you tell me, is this my answer? Would I get what they promising me? And it's like, oh my God, you're still chasing. 
you're still chasing. If only you knew it's inside of you already, but you got to dig it out. You got to go down there, get messy, you know, sit in the pain, get lost in the void. Nobody tells anyone this. Nobody tells anyone that you've got to do this yourself. And, you know, we're kind of now living in a culture, like you said, it's quite bonkers. Everyone promises everyone everything. And then a lot of, and, and you know, they're taking advantage of those people who are vulnerable and, you know, easily manipulated into these kind of paths, which is, I mean, again, I'm detached. I don't get upset, angry, because it could be the biggest lesson if they take it seriously. Like, you know, one of those really expensive courses that you put all of your hopes in can be your biggest lesson, learned lesson in, you know, it's a loss, but it's a painful and a big lesson to learn that you got to do this yourself. So I think it's all a, all a positive thing all around. But I'm really passionate about holistic approach to life, to being to living, to existence, and I'm all about holistic perspective, you know, less invest in our emotional health, less invest in our behavior and our consumerism. And, and you know, my existence shouldn't hurt another being. Like my existence in this planet shouldn't be at the cost of or a detriment to some another being. You know, I need to be able to take responsibility of this. And that's like, for me, that's the only way. Like if we can do all of us, if we can all do the same thing and come to a place of, you know, owning and taking responsibility and accepting maturity. I think a lot of us don't want maturity because the moment you mature, like, your rights have taken away from you that you no longer pretend, play, and play all these tricks and games. You know, you don't have that anymore. It's taken away from you. And um, it's very, very difficult, of course. But um, yeah. And uh, one last thing I wanted to say let's talk about more on the whole lifestyle change rather than fixing a symptom. Let's not just talk about depression, but talk about your whole reset of a lifestyle change, mindset change. You know, I think it was Robin Sharma. He says, like, mindset, but also soul set. All of that, I think, in consideration. Yeah. Mm. That's that's where the real crux of the matter is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, just I I did I I studied film and visual culture, and one of the things I encountered in my studies was the the, the Wizard of Oz, and so you kind of got the so within the personal development and in all realms really. But there is the that there are the kind of the wizards, and they're kind of telling you, "Oh, I'll give you a certificate." You know, you get the certificate. The certificate in itself doesn't mean much. You know, uh, there's, uh, and then you got the good witch Glenda, who said you always had the po power. You just need to discover it for yourself. So really, it's about empowerment. I, in my journey, I met uh, John Perkins, who is uh, known as, uh, he wrote the book, uh, The Economic Hitman, but he's a shaman and he's worked on five, you know, all continents, really. Uh, and he talked about this thing. So you might, like, you might, like, somebody might be a dancer and and he might say to them, show me how you dance. and And they might be dancing perfectly. And he would say to them in empowerment, he said, you already are a dancer. What you need to focus on is to be a, a hired, you know, a, a paid dancer. He might speak to people and it's like, I, I want to be a writer. And he said, well, show me something you've written. And they've written several books and they're very good. <laughs> so he said, you already are a writer. 
what you need to focus on to be a populist writer. You know, so in my ideal world is be that world of empowerment, of realizing what talent we already have, you know, and then flipping really what we all need to do this sounds very easy, but it is the simplest thing, but it's not. But it is, we all have to shift the paradigm of how we look at the world. And if we look from a, that's where conscious gratitude does work. If you can actually sit down, even on the days where you're the most bloody, <laughs> you really don't want to do it, but you can kind of, but you begin to adopt this lens of, I mean, how much do I actually have to be grateful? How isn't this incredible? And and then, you know, practicing practicing that ability to see, you know, the good in ourselves. See the yeah, like yeah. <laughs> I don't, I, I do not want to appear that like I don't have all the like I don't, I don't have all the answers, but I've got some very good questions, I and I will, that. I will basically, I would rather, I would rather have this, you know, these questions that can't be answered that I want to live in with, with, with with answers that can't be questioned. And that's kind of then, it's kind of like, and sometimes maybe we do that to ourselves. We we say, okay, well, that's just the way it is. You know, going back to that analogy about money, like, you know, there isn't enough, more is better, and that's just the way it is. You know, maybe sometimes we give ourselves, that's just the way it is. But what if it wasn't, <laughs> you know? And I do think within, when you face that ultimate fear of death and change within that, there's also that gift that if that is a change and that's just as a change and think about it, we are floating atoms, you know, 99, this is scientific. It's not like something up there, kind of up there, up there. It's like 99.9999999% of everything is space. So we're floating in this kind of thing. Within that realm, there is the zero point, there's the stillness. And when you can find that, but what, like, within all that fear, like, then the fear of change, maybe there's also, well, there's also, I can actually change. I can actually change. But what I need to work on changing is, is, is changing my frequency. It's, it's vibrating and it's, it, it's ultimately all about resonance and, and, and frequency and vibration and what I give out I will attract back etc and it's kind of and it's becoming a little bit it's becoming comfortable about having that play isn't it where it's not all so serious it is a game Susan <laughs> life is a game and you got to play it you got to act like it sometimes you got to but you've also got to allow yourself to have some fun I think when we when we are about to cross that whatever that threshold is when you're going to look back, like it's a, I often think about this, if people are going to write about me when I die, you know, I, am I going to write? He was an arrogant bastard. He had some expensive suits and he had a nice sofa, you know. <laughs> I mean, no. <laughs> I want, like, so I'm, I'm thinking, if I wanted them to write something good about me, what would I have to do? Like David Data, he says, what would you have to die if you knew you were going to die within a year? What would you need to do to die complete? Wow, that's a and big concept. It's, it's kind of like you know. So it's kind of like I don't know. I basically I study and I study and I and I see it, it does it resonate with me. And I'm not saying I got all the answers, but basically I would like to live in a the curiosity i like to live in a state of curiosity and kind of continuing to explore i love it <laughs> amazing and that's it mic drop moment thank you so much honestly this has been truly eye-opening as always and um amazing share and i love the fact that 
you're very cautious because when I asked you to come on, you always said, look, I don't want to present myself as like, because which is, again, the same issue that um, a lot of us, we don't know how to balance it. Sharing, but also looking like you haven't figured it all out. There is this fine line between, um, you know, presenting ourselves, oh, look, I've got everything together. I'm here, I arrived. I think this is quite dangerous. And I like the fact that you so consciously pick the way you want to share because you don't want to come across like, because look, this is one of the biggest, you know, in the spiritual realm and especially self-development space, everybody wants to look like they are experts and that's it, they have arrived. And um, this is why I love doing these fireside chats because we can, also be in the process and show that because this is a ongoing unfolding and infinite journey and that's okay what's wrong with accepting that maybe what i know now might be so irrelevant next month but that's okay right this is truly embracing the unfolding and trusting and and having the courage to share where you are at now without playing a game of, I'm here, like, listen to me. I know the answer kind of thing. That's why it really resonates with me. You don't have the answers, but you have really good questions. And that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much for all the things that you have shared today and being here with us. Um, truly appreciate you. Thank you, Swan. My pleasure, Susan. Yeah, it's. I think like if this like this something I've been kind of contemplating a lot. Like if you, if you if you actually are great, you know, one of the symptoms of greatness is is real humility. You know, Ooh, that's so but, cool. But the thing is, it's it's very easy to be humble if everybody is like. You know you are great right? it's a lot more difficult to be humble when everybody's kind of competing in this marketplace and kind of so i'm basically here to learn i'm here to learn from you i've learned so much from and i've you know i will be my own project for quite a while quite frankly and i then i look to attract the kind of mentors etc that can help me in my journey but i think it's really important to kind of like i'm here to learn and i've learned something from having this conversation and it's opening these conversations up from a place of authenticity and honesty and basically yeah what would this life be about if it's not about learning and it's not about evolving and it's connecting i think for me involvement connecting as long as i in my school of hard locks where i kind of make one mistakes and i'm oh my goodness i've made a mistake and then i learned something i own it and i've learned something and that is you know i think we have to reframe this whole idea that that you know this perfectionism is the worst basically perfectionism is like basically you've got to start before you're ready you're never going to be more ready than you are now <laughs> you've got to start something and you're going to have the kind of the boldness of conviction but you know anyway with humility <laughs> always <laughs> with humility and with great questions you you know this has been now that you said it i realize this has been the journey as long as i can be humble as long as i can keep the mindset of a student learner um, one of the per one of the amazing members in this group actually taught me one thing with one sentence he said when he first met me. He said, "Thank you, my new teacher." Just because we interacted, just because there was a post, and then he engaged with the post, and then I kind of engaged with his question, and then he replied, and just just that little that tiny moment of encounter. That's what he said to me. And I was like, wow, what a humbling moment to see everyone, everything, every encounter as teaching you something. 
this is the greatest humility, honestly. So that was like one of the biggest moments that, you know, when you have that moment, it changes you forever. It's definitely one of those moments. And again, one thing that you said, we're all on a roller coaster. No one's allowed to get off. Again, I don't think I've been the same person I've ever since. So we never know these interactions, how they change us. That's why I've always been so curious about people's stories and their journey because they carry so much gem, they carry so much treasure that they might say one thing that will shift your life forever. So important. And that curiosity is, is something we need to keep, you know, keeping it alive and keep going with that. So, and that being said, okay. So today's, I know we just want to keep close, but there's so much coming on, but I'm sure we can go on for another two hours, but I'm sure we can have you again maybe in the future uh, to carry on with the conversation. Thank you, very grateful. It's been a pleasure, Susan, thank you so much. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks, and everyone, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I know it's gone a little bit over time, but it's been so amazing. It was so timely right now, the process that we're in, and also um, a lot of people talking about, we entered into some energy thing going on this week, if you're feeling that, tune into this conversation. I think it will kind of put a lot of things in perspective. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.